Hello, and welcome back to the Restoral Planet podcast for episode four, with me, your host, Jack Cole. Today, I'm talking with Mary Colwell. Mary has a background in producing BBC documentaries, often focusing around conservation issues. In recent years, Mary launched her own organisation called Curlew Action to take up the plight of our wetland habitats, which are in decline across the UK. In this episode, we talk about what's happened to the English countryside, where things are headed, are these problems deeper than we realise, is Greta Thunberg the second coming? We talk about all these things in the following conversation, and if you like what you hear, then follow us at Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and now Instagram, because I've just figured it out. Or, if you'd like to make a donation, please go to restoreourplanet.org, and there you'll find links to all of our projects and much more. Thank you. Enjoy the conversation. Hello. Welcome back to our Astora Planet podcast. This is number four with me, your host, Jack Cole. And today I am speaking with a very inspirational lady and keen conservationist, Mary Colwell. How are you, Mary? Hello there, Jack. It's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you for asking me. No, no it's a pleasure um, to have you. So for, the, for those uh, listening, would you mind just talking a little bit about your background? What got you into uh, conservation? And maybe a little bit about curlew action and yeah just a little bit of yeah from there okay so um for most of my career really i have been a producer so i was a producer at the bbc natural history unit and i made uh, television documentaries uh, wildlife documentaries and i also made a lot of documentaries and actually still do on radio um and so my background is as a documentary maker a scientist and then a documentary maker um uh, but about 10 years ago i decided to um, do something a bit different, sort of, I, I felt like I'd done that quite a lot. And so I wanted to get more into conservation. And I um, did all sorts of things. I was interested in the relationship between world religions and conservation um, and did some work on that for a while. And then in 2015, I uh, saw a, a sort of notification come in from actually Birdwatch Island, which is like the RSPB in Ireland, but much smaller. And they had sent a notification through a fax, I think it was, or an email in those days, that said um, they were really, really worried about curlews in Ireland and that their numbers were plummeting right down. Um, and I've always loved curlews. I can't quite explain why I love curlews. They just are a bird which sort of speaks of wild places. It's like a wild songster poet, if you like, mm. of meadows and... Very iconic, curlews. aren't they? They really are. They are, really are. And they're quite big, so you can actually see them. Um, and so so I, it, that was very worrying. And then also in 2015, um, a seminal paper came out in a journal called British Birds, which identified these dramatic losses right across the British Isles and, as I knew then, in, in Ireland as well. Um, and so I decided I just wanted to do something to try and help. So I came to the end of a contract. And before I started another, I did a 500 mile walk from the west coast of Ireland to the east coast of England uh, to try to find out what was happening to curlews. To I put my documentary head back on, um, talk to people, not just scientists and conservationists, but also farmers and hunters and poets and anybody, uh, writers, and put together a picture of why curlews are so important to us and why they're disappearing so quickly from our landscape. And that resulted in Curly Moon. And after that, all sorts of things happened. And um, Restore the Planet were fantastic. And they gave me seed money to start my little charity called Curly Action. And here we are today. Fantastic. Indeed, here we are. So can you tell us a little bit, what are the, the main threats uh, facing the curly? Why are their the numbers uh, <laughs> decreasing so so rapidly? Yeah, the poor curly sort of gets, gets it from all sides, if you like. It's like it's in a boxing ring and it's got lots and lots of things punching at it from all different sides. <laughs> So he's on his last legs in, in quite literally in some places and the, the, the pressures on it are enormous so it's things like the way we farm the landscape how much forestry we're planting how our landscape use has increased the number of what we call generalist predators predators like foxes and crows and they eat ground nesting birds uh, so those are great big drivers but also uh, increase in access to the countryside and recreation and dog walking which is a lot of disturbance 
um, draining of the land, uh, which makes it hard for them to feed, insecticide, which takes away food for the chicks. You know, climate change is an increasing problem along the coast. Um, it's sort of taking away their roosting areas, but also it's actually just making life very stormy for, for birds that, that need to winter on the coast. Um, all sorts of things are beginning, like the climate change is really building up its pressure, but these other things have really taken their toll. So in Southern Ireland, for example, the curlews numbers have declined by 97%. So if I can put that into, into uh, context for you, that's down from about five to 7,000 pairs, something like that in the 1980s, and now there are 130. That's 97% in more or less 40 years. Yeah. And was it because something, again, you've sort of described a few issues as to why that's happening, but was there something, a real moment that caused that turn in the 80s, something specific, maybe yeah. policy or, or government or anything in particular? Yeah, it's, it's the sort of intensification of agriculture. We became very good at um, wanting to grow more, bigger, faster. I mean, the, the um, European subsidies encouraged a lot of um, intensification and less diversification. So if you imagine your old McDonald's farm, if you like, which is probably what Southern Ireland and a lot of Great Britain was like, um, that's disappeared now. There's very few farms like that anymore. They're big agribusinesses um, and they, they rule by sort of bottom lines and spreadsheets and how much can you get out of the land. So the intensification of the land post the Second World War, which gained traction uh, once we were uh, tied into big European legislation, which happened right across Europe, just was a death knell. I imagine a lot of those farms use sort of mon monocultural uh, crops, I, I, I imagine, which also has other problems with biodiversity, uh, etc. Um, so the the curlews, their main hangout, uh, their, their uh, habitat is, of course, wetlands. Um, would you mind just talking a little bit as to why wetlands are such an important uh, habitat in the UK? Um, and yeah. Yes, yeah. well, you're absolutely right. Curlews do love wetlands, but they don't just love wetlands, which is why they're so important for us to look at. Because uh, if you think of a wetland, uh, I don't know what people think of when, when you say the word wetland, but sort of areas of lakes and uh, wet grassland and so on, quite often. Sort of swampy. Uh, swampy, yeah. Um, uh, yes, they love those places. And they often spend the sort of winter months in wetlands. So on the coast, in estuaries, on wet grasslands like you're describing, um, they, they like that for the winter because it's got soft soils with lots of things and they can dip those beautiful long sculptural bills down into the soft sediment and pull out worms and things. So that's so they love that kind of habitat for the winter. But come the breeding season, come the breeding season, that's really important, they leave these very wet areas and they go inland and they start to breed in our farm fields and our meadows up in the, in the uplands on heather moorland or just up rough grassland up in the higher ground. Um, and that's where they lay their nests and have their chicks. And it's at that point where we're losing them. They are not reproducing themselves. The eggs and chicks are getting eaten or flattened uh, right across the board. So it's not the adult birds that are so in danger so much, it's getting them to adults that's the issue. Right, a lot, a lot of sort of larger birds, sort of, you know, such as albatross, uh, amongst others, they do have this problem, don't they, of reproduction, reproductive rates. Um, so, okay, what's uh, what, what has Curlew Action been up to in the last few years? How are they, how are they taking it on? Well, with uh, so many things going on with, <laughs> with curlews, which is great. So, um, after my curly walk, which I mentioned, the 500 mile walk across Britain Island, um, I organised four national conferences and uh, also, Prince Charles apparently loves curlews, who knew? And Indeed. he organised two of his own symposium as well. Um, and we had a meeting at 10 Downing Street. And um, there were sort of lots of activity going on. And they have resulted in something called the Curlew Recovery Partnership, which was seed funded by uh, DEFRA, by government. I'm the chair now. And uh, this is spearheading um, a sort of Curlew recovery across England with links out to the other nations. So there's lots and lots of good stiff stuff going on on that level, that organisational level. But also um, there's been an increase in the number of, of 
of smaller little ornithological groups, ex, you know, either experts or just keen amateurs or anybody who wants to get involved, working on their little local populations, trying to protect the nests in the, in, in the breeding time, um, either sort of alerting farmers that they're there so they can leave, not cut their fields too quickly, you know, so they, they get a chance, or by controlling predators, putting nest fences up. Sometimes you have to actually physically do lethal, lethal control on predators. Uh, which is a very difficult and controversial subject, uh, but stuff is happening to try to keep the keep them going while we sort out the legislation that will help farmers and land managers do the right thing for curlews. At the moment, the way that we pay land managers to look after their land doesn't necessarily work in the curlews' favour. So there's lots of work to be done to make it easy all round for them to survive. But we're working on it. Okay, okay, well, that's good. Some, some, work's, uh, some work's going on. One, one of the themes that we've had on this podcast in uh, past discussions is the issue of basically the, the youth uh, and how things are going forward. Do you feel quite positive about the way that the, the youngsters are uh, taking the torch, so to speak, and the way things are going generally? Or how do you but feel? In terms of, of nature, uh, I think there's more awareness now of the problems that we've got in the natural world than I've ever known before. So, I mean, I know it's because awful things, you know, so worrying things are happening, like strange climate weather that we've been having recently and lots of statistics about the decline of wildlife, um, big documentaries, you know, we're all much more aware and more uh, sort of educated on a big global scale, if you like, about what's happening. And it seems that the younger generation are really are very engaged in that. I mean, look at the activities of XR, for example, you know, uh, standing up and saying this isn't the world we want to inherit and, and we want it differently um, and my contribution to that is um, trying to and hopefully almost there establish a GCSE in natural history which is a qualification a secondary school qualification open to any school in England um, where you can literally go and learn about natural history that's not it's not biology, it's about what? It's about trees and plants and birds and mammals and insects and know them, name them, record them, observe them, know what they need, understand their ecology. I was reading a little bit about that GCSE before uh, you came on and am I right saying a lot of it's um, directed towards looking at the, the economic side of uh, conservation as well? Some of it will be, some of it will be to, to, to understand just how important an intact natural world is for our global economies. And in fact, the, the now uh, sort of heralded um, Das Gupta report, which was launched uh, this year, I think it was wasn't it, earlier this year, Professor Parta Das Gupta from Cambridge um, spent four years trying to understand the contribution of nature to global economies. And his report uh, came to the conclusion, which is no surprise, that we fundamentally need a healthy natural world to underpin our economic activities. And one of, the, uh, one of the findings that he came out with is that in order to be able to do that, in order for us to produce citizens that are nature literate, that understand the natural world and know how we can look after it so we can all benefit, we have to have an education system fit for purpose. And at the moment, we're not taught that stuff. And, um, and so one of the recommendations of the Task Up to report was to put teaching nature back into the schools again, which is which was great. Fantastic. No, that, that's uh, that's really exciting. Um, so what do you think are some of the major obstacles that what, what's obviously you're talking a lot about, you know, uh, there's great spread of awareness, especially the young, younger people. Obviously, you've got social media, some fantastic documentaries, some of which I'm sure you, you uh, produced yourself. Um, what are some of the, the obstacles or that aren't really budging, as it were? What's what's really kind of, sort of you know, stuck in the way of uh, real progress? I think that's a really complicated question. And um, I think if I could just name one of, one or two things. One is that the economic system which we operate under, all of us, is built on um, the, 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 the the model of constant growth, constantly producing, buying, thrown away, producing more. It's a sort of constant growth, constant reusing stuff. And uh, we're locked into that. We're locked into a high carbon, high resource use world. 
And it's very, very hard for us to break out of that. Uh, no matter how well-intentioned we are, it is very difficult to live a sort of virtuous green life. In, in, and I think that's a big problem for people. And I don't believe it's that uh, most people don't care or don't want to do it. I just think it's, the system doesn't help us do it well. So um, that's one of the things we've got and why the Dasgupta report was important and that we've got to uh, think of ways of living which don't abuse the world as heavily as we do at the moment. So that's a major stepping stone. Our economics is going in one direction and we need to be going in the opposite direction. And that's those are two very difficult things to bring together. Secondly, there's so many of us are very urban. Um, I live right in the centre of the city. I'm sh you know, many people watching and listening to this will be urbanites. And um, we are more dissociated from the natural world than we've ever been before in natural history. So we um, we might go out for a walk in it, but we don't know what anything is. We don't have we don't have that conversation with nature which we had say 50 years ago. Um, and so we become more urban, less connected. We're growing in our human population size. We're using more resources. We're burning more carbon. All those things are adding up to a very dangerous scenario. So I, I think there's huge forces against us trying to get back to the right place. It's very interesting you mentioned how urban urbanised we are. Um, one of the, the things I think was very symbolic of where things went wrong when you know certain people or there were certain courses, degrees, whereby you know said person, I'm going to study the environment. I'm going to study this. Whereas sort of my view is it should already have all been somewhat incorporated into, you know, if you're just going to study economics, there should already be that kind of environmental factor underpinning it. No, if you're going to study whether it's business or architecture. Um, um, and something I, I heard someone say today, actually, I was in a, just a little, little conference. Um, we need to think rather than us as stewards of nature out to protect nature, we should think of ourselves as nature protecting itself um, and I was wondering how you feel you mentioned you know all of us sort of fighting in our own little way what uh, hope do you have in terms of technology like do you think that technology is what's going to get us there because you mentioned XR a little bit earlier and my general opinion is that they're perhaps pushing a little bit too hard in some respects um, and what they kind of you know if we if if we just basically took on what they're saying, I mean, we would be in the ashes of uh, society pretty quickly. Um, it's just in terms of like, economically speaking. And I know obviously the pushback there would be, well, if we don't do something quickly, we're all going to be the ashes of our planet. Um, but what do you think in terms of the role that technology has to play in terms of getting us to where we are, where we need to get to? That's not so much another really, really broad question. <laughs> technology is just obviously one of the many many tools in the box that we need we need low carbon technology um, and we need to be to not use things that are very wasteful that streamline our activities that help us to do things more efficiently of course i mean of course we need that but that's not the solution in itself um, that's just helping us so we need to change everything we need to to have the, the, the technology, but we also need to change our mindset. More importantly, we need to change what's in our hearts and in our minds, I think, um, and, and, get, and, and want to live a simpler life. I think we just need to want to be simpler. And, and wasn't it interesting in these big lockdowns, how many people said, oh, me included, phew, you know, I don't have to rush off to London. I don't have to drive halfway across the country. And, and that's where technology helped us. Look, you and I are doing this and we're not Absolutely. in the same place, you know. So this is a really good way that technology is helping us. And people were enjoying that simpler life. And and I think um, if only we could even just, just build on that. But it feels like everything's going back very quickly to, to what it was before. So technology is only is part of the solution but it's only part of it it won't answer our problems uh, it won't it is not the gold the, the silver bullet but it is a one arrow in a quiver of many uh, that we have to have no that's that's really well put um do you think in some sense it might actually be like a, a deeper issue you mentioned there that we need to sort of really change our minds do you think it's almost if we can say almost like a spiritual issue in some sense a real kind of Something's really gone wrong in the underpinning of how we connect with our surroundings. Do you see that's, that's fair to say, perhaps? 
Yeah, I think if you look at any of the great religions in the world, uh, the founders of any of the great religions, I would challenge you to name me one that has said the way to a holy, fulfilled and a simple spiritual life is by consuming a lot. Not one of them. All of them have said the way to internal peace and happiness is to make do with less, is to just be content with fewer things um, and try to live in a more simple, stripped down, bare bones kind of way. Um, and then you, 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 you face the world as you are, not as some sort of artifact with lots of things around you. So I think it's a, I personally think it's an intensely spiritual thing, which is why um, one of my great heroes and someone who's inspired me and still inspires me all the time is a 19th century environmentalist called John Muir, who uh, was a Scotsman who went over to live in America, uh, ended up eventually founding America's national parks. Parks because as he famously said, everybody needs places to pray in and to play in. You wrote a book about him, didn't you? Sorry to okay. interrupt. Yeah, yes. Mary, yeah, sorry, I, I was just saying, uh, you wrote a book about him, didn't you? I did. I wrote the, the only, actually, British biography of him. Just a very simple biography uh, to introduce people to who this man was, you know. That, um, that we don't only need money and bread. We need other things, places to play and pray, as he put it. And I think that's... Um, I think that will, whether you're religious or not, will, will resonate somehow. You'll think, yeah, I know what you mean by that. Even if you have no, no religious affiliation at all, that sense of, of it's not all about consuming will resonate. That's brilliant. Um, okay, well, moving on from that, do you think that perhaps, you know, obviously the peoples of, peoples of history, uh, more of a, a pious, time people living off less um you know happy with less or more humble um pre-capitalism is basically what i'm saying um do you think that if you know people lean in more of a spiritual direction the rest the rest of these problems will follow and they'll kind of just i mean not easy as that but it seems to be a bit of a link there do you think again it's it's one of the things that we have to do. And I think I'd, I'd worry to say, oh, well, if everybody suddenly became very religious, we'd all be all right, because that, that wouldn't happen. And that, you know, that these are really, really complicated issues, which yeah. um, draw in all kinds of other things. But I, undeniably, if we all lived simpler lives, if we were all like um, the um, Amish people, that, you know, if we were, and it's pretty extreme, but if we were, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. You know, it's as simple as that. I personally don't want to live like that, but, um, no. but you... <laughs> as Me least, <laughs> Nearly got the beard for it, but... Uh, yeah, 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 you got the beard for yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you wouldn't want to... Um, you wouldn't want to say, oh, well, we've all got to go back and live this rather basic life because... Uh, there's lots and lots of things about the modern way of life which are wonderful, our medicine and our ability to see the world, and our, you know, great food and security and all that kind of stuff. Um, we, we don't want to let that go. So, so the sweet spot, where is that sweet spot? Where is that place that we need to get to where we feel we're living a rich life, but we get so much from, from stuff which isn't visible, which, which comes from somewhere else. And, and that's, I, I'm waiting for for the prophets to come and tell us that. I, I, I haven't heard one. There is no environmental prophet out there that's speaking in a way that actually means that much to me. Um, apart from someone like Wendell Berry um, in America, who's amazing in, in some of the things that he says. Um, so that's where I think we need to get to. I don't think it's as simple as, oh, we should all just go and be, you know, Trappist monks or something. That's right. Yeah. Well, there's a, a few things that I find quite interesting. Um, first of all, we're obviously living, especially in Western Europe, quite a irreligious uh, time, and we're sort of waiting for the prophets. Something I found quite interesting that with uh, Greta Thunberg um, is when she, uh, she, uh, you know, rose to the world stage. Is the, the Swedish, uh, I forget which church, Christian church, um, she outright declared that she is the second coming. Here she is. Uh, do, do you think there's uh, any any sort of truth to that? That there's going to be this sort of holy uh, 
prophetic youngsters who are going to guide us to the promised land of uh, green and sustainability or what, what do you think? There's some amazing youngsters, Greta is one of them, but there's lots and lots of great youngsters um, really coming out with visionary stuff. Um, do I think they're prophets? Yes, in the broadest sense of the term, of course they are, but... It probably would uh, be in a, in a, you know, well this is quite an extreme time that we're living in now, but under yeah. stress they probably, I yeah. know how it works in terms yeah. of... I mean, people who who go against the grain, who stand up, say something which is, uh, again, it is countercultural, quite courageous, asking for a different way, asking for something that's just not the norm that everybody wants to buy into. They have been labelled prophets through the ages. Now, that can be a religious prophet, can be a secular prophet. Um, but people who give a mess, a courageous message in a messy age are the people that we need to hear more of. And... There is too much that the, the environmental world, the world of natural history is ever so divided and uh, there's lots of anger and angst and sort of partisan stuff going on. I don't think we've got time for any of that. I think we've got to pull together a lot more and swim against the tide. The, um, the I think it's what Pom, uh, Pope John Paul, uh, Pope Francis, not John Paul, Pope Francis, the current Pope said, um, these he said are the authentic people. And I think if there's a word that I want to bandy around and, and, you know, sort of put on every billboard, are you being authentic? Are you really being authentic? Because if you are, then that's great. But if you can't say, yes, I probably will, I need to look at that, then that's yeah. quite a good test. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Celebrity culture is a bit of a, bit of a pain in this regard, isn't it? The rise of narcissism. Uh... <laughs> Right. And unattainable goals. Unattainable goals. Right. Um, well, I think that leads me nicely to the last question I'd like to ask you, Mary, which is what makes you feel positive about the future of conservation? And throw in a bit of curlews in there, of course, as well, if, uh, if you'd like, just so we keep on topic. <laughs> well, actually, curlews are a really good way to feel positive because um, whenever I talk about curlews, I give talks or whatever, you know, the response is always so positive. People want beauty and song and that loveliness in their lives this is a bird that is not commercial you won't make money from it it's not going to cure any diseases it's not going to make sure people have jobs it's you know it's just a bird in a field or on a mud flat that sings a beautiful song and yet the effort going in now to protect it says we really do want to hold on to things like that that's really important to us you know if only we uh, if we only ever protected things that made money for us, that would be a sad world. But I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing people caring about stuff just because it's so damn lovely. And, and that gives me hope. The youngsters we talked about, they give me hope. You know, The, the fact that when it comes to it, um, James Lovelock, great sort of environmentalist said. Still alive. Yes, yeah, still alive. 102, I think he is, something like that, 101. Goodness so, is yeah. <laughs> well, when uh when up against it you know when the forces are coming over the hill to destroy you we're quite good at banding together and working together to fend them off there are, there are reasons to be hopeful but uh and so and if you don't hold on to hope you may as well just just go and consume to use it and <laughs> right. close, really you know? <laughs> yeah but i'm not going to do that and i don't think many people want to do that Yes, I, I, no, I agree with you. I think that's uh, that's the way things are going. Mary, where can people find you if they want to support you and, and your work? Oh, lovely. If they would like to support my Curlew work, I would be very, very grateful at curlewaction.org. If you just look up Curlew Action um, and uh, all sorts of things. We do a lot of outreach work. Uh, we support projects that need a bit of support, you know, a bit of help with getting some fencing or uh, we do a lot of public outreach stuff. Um, we've supported a group recently of painting murals of endangered species, of which Curly was one, um, on walls in cities, you know, to sort of brighten people's days and remind people of the loveliness out there. So please uh, support us, uh, support the idea of the GCSE and natural history. Um, and there's still work to be done on that. So I'd love to hear from anybody. But more than anything, if I could just give one last message to people listening, if you want to change the world, choose something to love and just love it and if you love it then you have to do something because love never comes alone love always comes with responsibility and sacrifice and courage and determination and 
If you choose something, I don't care what it is, choose something to love and love it. And together we'll change the world. Mary, thank you. <laughs>